Hello, chess friends. This is International Master Valera Lewa Pen. Today, we're going to be talking about um, one of the most popular openings in chess, King Indian Defense. Now, I'm not going to be talking to you about long and tedious variations or a little bit of the wisdom of the opening. I would like to show you how to play it. And literally, we're going to be discussing the different type of techniques and principles you have to keep on top of your mind every single time when you choose to play this opening. We're actually going to start with a game that was played between Victor Korchner and Robert James Fisher, Bobby Fisher, in the Herzog Navi Blitz Tournament that was actually played um, in year 1970. This was one of the best years, I believe, for Fisher, and he was in his prime and, you know, in two years, he was going to be the world champion and the greatest player who ever lived. So who better to show us how an opening like the King's Indian you know, works? But let's take a look and see how he did it in this particular game. So basically the way it started was D4. Now we have, you know, if you see some text, these are all knows by Bobby Fisher himself. If you like me, I can send you those. Uh, later, so after d4, black played knight of six, c4, g6, knight c3, and then ultimately black played bishop g7. That was followed by d6 and short castle. So this is the king Indian structure. Now, as you can see, this is a very specific type of formation where we don't only have a very secure position for the king, but we willingly uh, give away the center. So white can have those three pawns taking a huge number of squares and space around the middle, making sure that he feels more comfortable. That is a really good idea. However, there's a very important thing for you to know. He lacks preparation. That's what black is relying on. Ultimately, the idea is going to be that when white gets that center, that control around, Black is going to get the possibility to counter it. And that's where we're going. The first core idea of the opening is being able to develop our pieces fast and get exactly the kind of structure that will help us to counterattack White's center. So we're talking about counterattacking. Now, see, this comes at a cost. A lot of the times, if you don't succeed, you can possibly get into a rather, you know, passive and a vulnerable position. However, if you make it right, it's going to give you more than just a possibility to fight for equal game. It can give you an advantage. So always when you do that with black, it comes at a risk, but it's worth it. So let's take a look and find out how Fisher did it. So the move short castle. White played normally knight of three, e5, castles. What we see here is knight c6, and there is the plan. All black wants to do is to pile up as many pieces as he can against the center and prepare to either exchange those two pawns and potentially create a strong pressure on e4 or even against d4, if allowed, or to force white to take action and close it so that once the center is stable, black will be in a very good condition to start his own plan. The major plan in King Sindian for Black is to start advancing on the king side. We can call it a pawn storm. We can call it any way you want. The idea is that, you know, we're going to have enough, just enough power to make the, the different tactics, you know, significant. Very nice. Now, after that, apparently Black plays knight e7, knight d2. And this is um, one of the key moves. So, uh, the idea is that white stops the black knight from coming to h5 actively so otherwise it will go to h5 and f4 and of course he's in intending to still proceed with his plan of b4 c5 that actually helps him to advance on the queen side where everything is supposed to go so maybe he can also plan up with knight c4 to pressure against d6 this is where it all goes okay so um what do we do right now as black? So first and foremost, this is very important in this position, is that black plays c5. 
Now, this is a very interesting idea. Black makes a very strong strategic decision. His decision being the chance to stop White from playing the move of B4, you know, and this is important. We want to prevent him from being able to do that. And, um, of course, once we lock up the queens, that we're going to have much more freedom and time to build upon our active activity on the king's side. So this is like a very, very good idea to do. So like what what happens in this type of position is I plays A3. He wants to prepare it no matter what we're doing. And he still wants to advance against the c5, open the lines, and get his counterplay going. What do we do now? In fact, actually after a3, black played knight e8. White plays b4, and then black does b6. And we could realize now that not just the stability, but also... Most of black speeders are in a pretty strong condition to keep going. We can just go ahead with f5, knight f6, f4, g5, and then we're really going to get ready with a move like queen e8 to process more, more of the attack on the kings. Now, there's also a very significant advantage that black has up front. The chance that his development is already better, I'd say much better, than anything white has in the opposite area. And this is a huge deal. If you already have a very good development as opposed to your opponent, you're at a, at a high ground already. And we are. Truth is, white's going to have a problem now. And I'm not just talking about the space. I'm talking about the ways and how the pieces and everything else looks. No, it's not losing. Don't worry. I'm, I don't want to sugarcoat it that much. Although Black's plan is following the most logical idea, f5. So, in this case, Fisher was saying that probably knight b3 is a little better, but I don't think that it makes much of a difference. Anyway, let's talk about what you guys would do. Tell me what you think should be Black's best response or possibility to continue right now. How, do we, how does he carry on the plan? Now, while you think about that, I do want to tell you that I just have actually had the kindness to provide a fantastic course at a brilliant discount. It's like Grandmaster Lemo's new course on the King's Indian Defense, which means nine hours of some of the most fascinating plans and ideas against pretty much any system that people uh, uh, you know, can play against you. He provides great theory great plans, and more importantly, great insight. And you might actually find that link for the brilliant more than 50% discount on the link below this video. I did post a link on the chat as well, so you might want to check it out. So let's get back to the game now. What should be Black's best resource to continue? What must he do now? I do want to say that there's nothing that should make us to actually go away from what we started. Black has already begun his activity on the king's side. I think you must actually carry it forward. Whatever goes, this is the plan. And Black thereby decided, I'm just going for F4. Strong, solid, and consistent. You know, there, there are other moves to play, of course, but F4 felt right because... While it certainly helps Black to advance and get, move forward, what you get to see is that we have FG5, Knight G6, and that pawn sets up a lot more for this position. And so we have a great position possibility, and then we have the ability to really have advance with Knight of 6, H5, and G4 out there, which is very, very good. Okay, so White played with the move A4. And then black plays g5. Now, what happens next? a5. Well, it's even faster at that moment. That's okay. But there's no problem. The difference between white's attack and black's attack isn't so much about the speed. It's about the targets. While black is going after the white king, white is going against the black pawns. And from that aspect alone, we understand that Black is better, a lot 
better, you know, in this position. Because of apparently the attack against the king matters and costs a lot more than anything else that white may or may not be able to do on the queen's side. This is essential. And what comes out next in this position? After this move, ultimately, uh, black plays with the move of rook to the f6 in this moment. He actually goes ahead and he reaches out for a powerful g6 position. It's a sp spot that is going to give him a uh, huge opportunity for attack. And then we're doing it as good as it can be. Let's take a look and see what comes next. After that move, apparently, uh, you know, one had to do the move of a pawn takes. And then after the pawn takes, this is a mistake. As Korchner pointed out afterwards, Fisher says, this is a terrible mistake because it's impossible for White to get any initiative on the queen side. So he had to keep what I'd call the tension there. And the tension had to be kept and it had to be, you know, advanced in that way. He didn't keep it. So things aren't really going all that well anymore. This is important. So anyway, let's take a look and see what happened, actually. So after the move of... Um, okay, so there it is. Beatix of the C. Then Black continued with Beatix of the C himself. Knight B3 and the Rook to G6. It should be 2. Knight F6. So look at how... Easy it is. That's one of the important things about such a play, that you'd like to make things happen easy. You don't want to complicate it. You don't want to make things, you know, like look difficult or, 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 or hard. The simpler it is, the lesser of a chance, less of a chance for a mistake is going to be there. And that's why, that's exactly why black plays it this way. Simpler, it's easier, and it is more, much more straightforward. So knight goes up. Then white decided to play king to the h1 in that position. Not a great move, I certainly have to say, but he just wanted to escape from the from the possible you know, like target view. Okay, makes sense. And then as he did it, black plays g4. Maybe a little more exact was h5, but you know we create an instant tension against White's position now. And this is not something to be dismissed. It is a strong idea, and it continues being as good as it can be. So there it is. Very important. Now, after that, apparently White decided to play F takes G, forced because of the possible threat of, uh, you know, G3 or, like, rook h6 and everything. Why it felt like I have to do this. Otherwise, it can get a little hard, a little, hard, a little challenging. So he took knight takes g4. Rook f3. I suppose that, you know, this was not the best move. As Fisher says, bishop f3 would have definitely allowed, allowed him better defense, but he did rook f3. And now there is another a huge question. How do we play this here? What to do in that position? Do we continue with the attack of by playing rook h6, or do we do anything else? Take a moment now to think about this. It's a good, it's a good question. It's definitely a good position to talk about. Tell me, like, write down your thoughts and ideas on what you would say is the best way for black to carry on and advance his play. It is definitely a good position, something we want to do. How to play ahead. Well, definitely rook h6. I mean, come on, it's a tempo move. It helps us to create a significant pressure instantly without any without any delay. I mean, whatever we think of the move, it's just strong. It is powerful. And so after the move of rook h6, white played h3. And then black played a move of knight of the g6 in this position, which realizes the knight on an even more powerful place as it now has the ability to go ahead and then turn itself amazing on the h4. Wow. I mean, that was simply 
incredible. It was a great move. It was a great follow through against the opponent. And it just, you know, it really seems to be helping out in that moment. So after Rook H6, White plays King G1. And then Black plays Knight F6, moving across and helping to get this um, idea of, um, you know, like Knight H5. And you see, we're not rushing it. I mean, it doesn't mean that you have to slow down. But ultimately, you know, like, what you want to do is to think about speed and stability at the same time. That means the faster you are, the more stable your position needs to be. Because if you let things go, you know, like uncertain or bad, you're not going to have enough. At this early stage of the attack, you're not going to have enough to compensate. So this is very interesting. Black knew this. We're not going to have enough to compensate it, so let's better take the chance, keep the build up, and hold more power. It's necessary and important. Let's see what comes next. This should be one. Knight h8. I love this move. And this move introduces one of the best possibilities of the king's Indian itself. The possibility for black, the idea is that black could actually regroup some of his pieces and really find that wonderful. What you find out in this position is that that knight isn't just going to have the ability to go through f7 to g5, but also we see that we have time. See, speed depends mostly on the time the opponent's going to spend in order to deliver different type of challenges or threats. If the, if, if the opponent does not have the ability to create that many threats or challenges, you've got nothing to worry about. See, that's something that Black knew very well about. And things are great. So this is very important. After knight h8, white plays rook to the d3. And then, you know, like, uh, black plays knight to the f7. So after that move, then apparently white has to play bishop f3. So, like, he, he wants to hold it. He wants to control a little bit more. So what do we do now? Hmm. Yes. Yeah, so actually what you have to remember is this. Fisher knew the strength of consistency. King's Indian is especially an opening in which we need to be as consistent as possible with everything we do. That means we can't possibly even allow ourselves to just move around and not to stay true. If our plan says we got to go on the queen, we got to go there. See, this is very necessary. You need to sequentially move along and plan your pieces on the area where you feel your activity is going to work. Now, that's something good. I'm just talking about like an idea. This is a, a really important plan of action. So knight g5, white played queen to the e2 out there. And so this is important. What to do next in this position? So, for example, after that type of a move, we're seeing that black plays rook to the g6 and there. So, uh, in fact, after that move of rook to the g6, we have knight takes to the h3, and uh, so that's a great way to go forward. We have that opportunity to follow up against the knight takes h3, maybe with a move of queen to the e7, or bishop takes to the h, and um, yeah, so uh, that's great. Now, what to do next? You know, like, the other thing that you would like to do uh, is first and foremost, remember that. Get space. You get activity, everything looks well, but don't forget to look at the key defenders. Everything that the opponent has, no matter what your how good your preparation is, everything he's built and everything he's, he's going with is based on the main defenders, the things without which his defense would actually um, lose. But that after we get that, that opportunity uh, with the move of Knight takes to the h3. In case of the knight takes h3, g takes h3, then we're having the possibility to play bishop takes to the h3. And uh, 
That is amazing. Strong, powerful, and dangerous. I place king f2. Not a good move, that's for sure. But so what do we do next, actually? Well, I think that uh, oh, I have to tell you that when you're really looking at so much of the space and activity in line, you, you got to know we are almost there. We are almost as close as possible to the, you know, to the position and the, the potential. But, hmm, but the thing you need to know is that precise sequence is necessary. And I'm not just talking about it and like just talking about it. You need to have a very precise sequence as to where or how you can arrange your pieces so that they can do the right things, the right ideas. So how does that work? Knight g4 check. Beautiful move. Brings the queen close, gets the pieces ready, so we have a strong bishop, great rook, a wonderful queen, and all of this is coming together at the white king. This is a perfect way to follow. And uh, so, for example, after bishop takes the g4, then uh, we have bishop takes the g. Now there's queen h4, and here, fortunately, I thought for a minute, Fisher says, and not seeing, um, you know, the any defense against queen h4, bishop takes the here is on. This is the most important, uh, you know, game sample that you could understand what the King's Indian is all about. It is not an opening about some, you know, like huge tactics or whatever. It is an opening about a gradual and effective buildup that once you do successfully, you can eventually pick up its fruits. But you have to do this one step at a time. And I think that was definitely really great before Black when he played it. Starting from the beginning of being consistent. Second, <sighs> focusing on how the opponent is going to actually suffer due to, the, due to the B4 inability. And more importantly, making sure that we combine the piece with pawn strategy in order to advance open lines and create certain pressure against the opponent's position. It was a great way to go. It was very efficient as it happened. Now, I want to show you another game that was just as good and interesting. It's played by Timur Rajabov himself. That was a much or more recent, much newer game. And it was played between Timur Rajabov versus Alexei Shirov. Now, once again, if any of you guys want me to send you those games with, with the annotations, please send me a message. You can send me a message actually on my email, which is valeri.rilla at gmail.com or directly through my website, which is basically tigerlilov.com. If you want, I will, you can send me a message with any questions. Maybe your game's in that opening or another. I'd be very happy to have a look and uh, give you my input. Also, don't forget to look at the ninth hour course, only available for a few hours at an incredible discount. Grandmaster um, Daniel Lemos actually did this beautiful, brilliant uh, course on the practical sides of this opening, so you could really learn a lot from it. Well, let's take a look at this game. Shirov is known as one of the as one of the most effective attacking players of our time, and certainly with so much center, of course we can expect that he could try to really push Black in the corner. Yet Rajabov's major favorite weapon was the King's Indian, and it still is. He still continues to play it wonderfully. Let's take a look and let's see what happened. E5, castles, knight, c6. We have the same line. Absolutely. And then as black played it in this way, white plays b4, knight h5. Now you can see that white didn't take the time to, uh, you know, make some sort of different, you know, approach. He just played b4 in order to, you know, grab some space and possibly focus on c5 and other things. It's, it made sense. He does. Now, what should black be doing? Well, after the move of knight to the h5, in this position, white plays rook e1. And in here, there was the move of f5 coming up. Interesting. Very interesting. Five same idea goes on, apparently. So what's happened is that apparently white has a bit of a difficulty. He continued with, uh, uh, you know, actually in this position, knight g5 was the move, hoping to get some 
space and opportunities in that area, and that's fine. We don't bother of any of that from any of this. Next move is knight f6. It's it's important structurally to understand that knight f4 may be a good move, but also it may be a little pushy. Black decided that at that moment there's no need for us to rush that knight through and then like, risk on having it attack with g3, even though usually it is the correct move. Just I want you to be careful about that because on occasion that is a kind of move that could pose certain difficulties or certain problems. So consider that. Keeping that in mind, ultimately, led black to play the knight of six and off the f3, king h8. Oftentimes, Rajabov does a move like king h8 and similar improving regrouping moves in the king Scythian. The reason is because those moves will always come handy. So that later, eventually, when we drive the knight away, we can have rook g8. But most importantly, we have the time. As even if white plays c5, that doesn't come out with a direct threat. So the idea is, if you have the time to put in some preparation and build up, I always recommend you to do that. Using the time you're given in order to back things up. And then when the bat, when the action starts, when the tactics begin, you will be ready. And that's something very necessary for Black, and he did it. 96. Now, apparently White didn't want to go back, and he didn't want to wait for sure until Black just does, you know, like this type of, this type of tactic or whatever. So White felt it necessary to, you know, just open up and do whatever. So you played like that. Bishop takes to the and then D takes to the E came through. And so now after that move, surely the idea is that uh, you know we don't have to worry as there's knight h5. The knight's gonna come down to the f4 now. Knight plays g3, and then we're actually setting up and preparing for bishop f6. A smart idea. Not only it covers the g7 square. But it also helps us to set up the uh, rook g8 plus g5 and similar opportunities in that area. It's great. And black does it well. After that, white played c5, f4. <clears throat> and then after the f4 move, what happened is that white plays king g2. Knight c6, c6 to the d. Interestingly enough, as you can see in this position, c to the d, white's got nothing to back it up. You must always have what I call the wide look, the eagle eye towards a certain position so that you can evaluate the different aspects of it, both in terms of, you know, like preparation and control. White feels behind. And I do want to say that because it is true. Most of his own pieces don't feel like they've got enough neither of the preparation the power or the control that he needs in order to set things right that's beautiful if you look at black however you find out that a lot of his own opportunities are going to be perfect and he applies much of that in a wonderful way what's coming out next is as in interesting as it continues let's say it here, after that move, white plays knight d5. So you may be wondering in that position, okay, why? Why are we just waiting for him to jump in at there? Well, truth is, when white jumps in with his knight at the d5 square, we don't have to worry. And why am I actually saying that? Well, you don't have to worry for a number of reasons, the most important of which is the fact that that um, the knight itself does not create any real threats. And for this reason, if the knight doesn't actually make or create any big, any big tactics or attacks, why bother? After that, of course, black simply advanced with his own knight on the b4. Little by little, we're just getting our own pieces and possibilities in play, and things look good. Yes, they do. Now, what's come out next? Well, 
Considering what happens here, white played bishop b2. He decided I can no longer wait until something just goes. I want to do my own stuff. I want to finish up with my own development, and uh, I'll figure out where this leads to. So what should Rajabov do now? Think about this, guys. What would you like to play as black at this point? <laughs> it's a very good question. A really important move. Hmm. Anyone? Let's see. Black is in develop like black is kind of developed. He's got space and he's got control, but what should he do? Really to follow. And here I see no suggestions specifically, but I would nevertheless love to hear one or two. So please do do let me know about your thoughts, as it's very important. His next move is really I mean Black's next move is really important. Well, I guess nobody knows exactly what is Black's best idea, and that's totally all right. Let me tell you now. Truth is, you don't have to do anything specific. The idea is that all we want is to stabilize. Black just took the pawn. He wasn't worried about White's tactics or threats going with G4, because all Black can do is simply solidify. And we're almost playing it positionally, even though we know that there is no reason. Black plays positionally because he cares a lot more about the structure itself and the control as opposed to anything else. And now that is perfect. We got space, we got control, we got a pack an extra pawn. You may even wonder where did where did White miss the, the handle? But he really missed it a lot earlier. And the attack just doesn't actually tend to work simply because there's nothing to back it up with. Again, I, I know that I repeat myself by saying that, but this is so important. He has got nothing, nothing at all that can help him with a different activity. So uh, let's take a look. After the move of, um, you know, like knight to the g7, and there was this move. Okay, so queen d5, queen e7. I mean, we don't care. Whatever white attempts or tries with his queen, it's not nearly as dangerous. Black is just going to stabilize. He's going to solidify in the center in that way. And he, white cannot progress. Can't do anything in this position. Very interesting switch. But black didn't really switch that much, if you think about it. It was all about a very natural, very normal way of simply stabilizing the position. Now we have a clear pawn up. And we're ready to go. Like what? Do what? Good question, isn't it? I love it. Well, actually, all that we want to do is play b6, rook f8, and h5. Still continue the plan. Now, sometimes people get so much carried away with their plans of attack, defense, whatever it is, you name it that oftentimes they completely forget how the most important thing in these positions, you know? And the most important thing about these positions is stick to your guns. Whatever you started, you have to continue it. Because if you don't, what's really going to happen <laughs> is that you will let your opponent to figure out a way to make his own attack without even posing an actual issue of threats or problems over his position. This is why it's so important, and I say like this to use this type of little little concept, sticking to your guns, like making sure you have your play going no matter the outside forces, the outside, like I, I your pawn up, you, do you have an outline here, or whatever. Okay, maybe some of that will matter, but still, you can't afford to slow down or stop. Some people even stop their plans just because of that. And so right here, what we, what were we doing in the position? Queen h4, rook c6, g5. It's coming up real quick. There is that move. And then what do we do next? 
G4. Moving it all up. Forward and up. Now we're letting the whole center to almost fall apart because it doesn't matter. The only thing that does actually matter is what's going to happen on the opposite area. This is what's really key. And uh, that's it. That's White actually doesn't have that many moves. He tried rook takes these things because he realized if anything like bishop takes to the e5 takes place, Black is going to be able to play queen h3. The only way to protect this would be meant by g takes f, and then there's a disaster coming, you know, within some of the next moves, like f2 and others. It's just uh, it's too painful. It's too dangerous. Like, you know, there's more. Like knight takes h5, maybe even two. So um, White felt like this is bad, so he played rook takes d6, and he gave away the queen. I mean, truth is, probably that wasn't the best, yet just the queen, those pawns, the knight always ready to jump on the h5 show that uh, the position is too promising. So White played uh, rook takes d6, takes, check, here, and bishop c4. Finally hoping to get some type of energy and, uh, you know, attacks in the play. Well, what would you guys do here as a defense for Black? It's a very important question. Very key question. Hmm. You see, the truth is we already have quite a bit of space on the king side so let's just carry it forward we don't have to think about anything else just just do g dix f3 and as i say it's just stand stand up keep up the advance hold the attack going i played king h1 knight takes h5 even though white's pressure does seem pretty concrete and quite good to say the least again the same thing he's suffering by there is nothing Nothing that is going to allow him, you know, to just, uh, you know, advance forward or create even larger or bigger threats against black in this position. Check was nice, but then black countered it with knight g3. And uh, that was it, really. Just if you think about it, you're going to realize this. It's not possible for white to do much more. And, uh, yeah. That was it. Let's take a look and see what happened. After this move, <clears throat> White played with uh, Rook takes G, F takes the G, and then after that, uh, Rook takes H4, G2, F2, F1, and Rook D2. That sequence is basically forcing, so, like, you know, there's nothing White can do in between. And that's why he's losing it. I mean, what really made this possible for Black to win so quickly? I mean, here, apparently, being a rook versus bishop, that should be easy for Black to win. The game's already over. But really, if we go back to the beginning, I want to show you the elements. Playing King Sindian is about knowing how to constantly be on top, making sure that every move both helps you to keep a good stability in the position without any major or apparent weaknesses, while you're constantly having the active opportunity for a push. Counterplay. That's what I'm talking about. So we realize the, et the tension that Black already had against the E4 was very important. And so this is a very valuable idea because we're having the ability to, to exercise more pressure. And we're having the opportunity to keep White on the back side. Very interesting as an idea that <clears throat> Black really did deliver this type of sequence because as a result of all this, not only most of Black's own forces were actually in place and carried on the attack, but the majority of White's own pieces had very little to do on their own, including the bishop on e2, the bishop on b2, and the rest just couldn't even do anything. That's how powerful it was. The interesting part is about possibilities. We're talking about what really can happen, not what he wants to make it. He never could. No, I never could make anything. So it was a very successful strategy coming from the from the part of Black's play 
that just gave him that type of uh, you know attack, moving on the king side and transforming into something as efficient, you know, in the in that way. So it was that was good. Takes and rook takes to the e6 here, rook h6 this one, and interestingly enough, after white played bishop c4 g x f, we realized it's just it's meant to lose this whole sequence. It's meant to force white into forfeit. What I want to do is I would very much like to show you that third game. There is one more game that I've actually prepared, and I think you're going to love seeing this. It's played between Mark Taimanov and Miguel Nydorf. It's a classical game, actually. And it was a game that was played in uh, the Zurich Candidates Tournament in 1953. So what was this game really about? Let's take a look. D4, knight f6, c4, g6, knight c3 here, e4, d6, there, and now this was the move. So what is, what's actually happening, interestingly enough in this position, is that, uh, I mean, as black progresses, you know, we have the same type of variation. Would, you, would I say that this is, you know, great? Is it good? Is it bad? Like, what is it? Well, I'm, I'm just going to say that it was very efficient. And it definitely seems to work. Let's take a look and see. Close. D5, knight e7. Here, knight d7. This is another opportunity on how black can both take a command over the c5 square while he's still in preparation for f5. He doesn't change anything regarding the main structure, yet it allows black to continue advancing and consider following up on that area of the board. f5, f3, f4, bishop f2, g5. What's so exciting about this is just the fact that black keeps on going. <clears throat> we have the opportunity to think of knight of six, but we also have the opportunity to think about h5, g4, queen e8, and queen to g6. It is the essence of pressure that allows black to really set things in motion. Knight of six is a wonderful idea, and the knight g6 also comes up. It's a beautiful really efficient way of going. Seven. And now we understand a little different type of approach. Whole idea behind it is that while the position around the center is stable, black ba white ba uh, basically wants to play with rook, eight, rook to g7 and really control the game with h5, g4. I know that I'm showing you the easy way on how this whole thing works, but really it's not supposed to be difficult. It is supposed to be made by anyone, grandmaster or not. C takes to the d5, d6, pawn takes, queen d2, and g4. You see, we're talking about grandmaster games, but it feels so easy as long as you know these structures of development that you can do it too. Now, surely you can. not Just learn. The ideas. Now, once again, do not forget that Grandmaster Lemos, one of the um, specialists of this opening, has made this brilliant course uh, of a, um, a fantastic course, actually, a nine-hour, nine-hour complete course on how to play the King's King's Indian, and it is right at your fingertips. It comes with an incredible more than 50% discount, available only for the next few hours. So, if you want to check it, look at the link below this video, or look into the chat. Now let's talk about what really happened. Now after the move of g4, white played rook c1. And it made sense. I mean, he, that's what he wants to do. So here, next move, there is g3. And what is super about this game is we see the speed and the difference with which black is actually making this whole thing to work. The rest doesn't really matter. H takes G, F takes G, Bishop takes G, not H5, opens up an attack. And when the bishop actually moves right back in that moment, we're continuing in the same direction. B6, 
bishop b7, and bishop b7. Now, you're probably going to say, but pawn, it's a little, I mean, I, I feel a little on edge about giving myself, giving, giving him up an opportunity like this. Should I do this? Well, truth is no. You better don't. But in particular, when you think about this position, you understand that after queen e1 and bishop g5, the pawn really doesn't matter. I call this the idea of values. In every position, we have different set of values we could think about. If the position is tactical or dynamic, we care a lot more about initiative, pressure, and active pieces. If we get a position which is a lot more uh, positional or quiet, we care a lot more about static values. Very importantly in such a moment, it is to think about how the pieces can grow, improve, and really step forward, moving for moving up. Black builds up a position that is a lot superior and much stronger than any of white's pawns, pieces, or potential on the queen side. And so, finally, he ends up playing the move b5. I find this move to be the most beautiful in the whole game because even though it comes at a moment where things are more or less decided, this is the actual move that cuts off and undermines everything. White's not able to play knight c4 now, make b6, or actually deliver any counterplay. The worst thing of all is to make sure there is no counterplay. And so, essentially, white played a4, a6, exchange, rook c7, and rook g7. With no counterplay or very little to no opportunities of success, white attempted this vague knight b3 idea, hoping that maybe, just maybe, that can give him a chance to uh, to step back. But it was just useless. It didn't really matter. After knight h4 and rook c2, I'm going to give you the chance to find a last straw into black's plan and what he did last. There was one more move. After that, the game was over. What would you guys say black must do right now anyone well there it is bishop h3 using the least capable piece to set things up and advance towards our opponent. It was a great move, a beautiful tactic, and an idea that if the g2 pawn goes away, we're going to be able to play with queen g1, and we're going to destroy whatever he's got on that area of the board. Strong, simple, and effective. That's the way we do it. Knight takes g2, captures queen h4, and, I mean, what was losing because you know the truth is after queen h4 he either has to give away the queen or knight g3 is a killer either way it was game over i mean obviously these are the most perfect examples quote unquote on how black is able to apply to play white he's, he's has he's got his own possibilities and if you're looking at this lecture and hope to find something great for white you're probably scared you know completely from what i'm showing you but remember one thing White has his own possibilities. There are plenty of ways, and one of my most uh, important considerate ideas is that White can play g3 plus bishop g2, or even f3 with an idea to cast so long, which is the Zemish. Those are dangerous lines for Black, and he needs to know them well. We couldn't obviously cover them today due to the time limits, but I do encourage you to check this uh, brilliant course by Grandmaster Lemos because he includes a lot of these and more with great ideas for both sides in his new course. Most important thing, though, is make sure that you actually uh, study it and uh, you know, make sure you've got the possibility to play this because it's a brilliant opening and it's a lot better than many of the others that are out there. I do encourage you to try and include this in your repertoire and study the different plans that Black has available. That's something that is beautiful and can help you a lot more as you plan. Thank you so much. I hope that you had a good time. 
please don't forget to check out the course below the video. And again, if you have any questions or you want some input, you can always reach me on my email, which is valeri.lilov at gmail.com or my website, tigerlilov.com. Thank you so much, and I'll speak to you next time.